Hello and welcome to My Baseball History, presented by the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum and Baseball Library in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm your host, Dan Wallach, and I'm the executive director of the museum. My Baseball History is a long-form interview podcast where each episode I'll talk to someone new who has some sort of association to the game of baseball. No matter who I talk to, we'll talk about how they fell in love with baseball, how their career started, and how they got to be where they are today. On today's episode, I spoke with the incredibly talented Greg Kreinler, who is quite possibly my favorite living artist. Greg was born in 1980 and grew up in Rockland County, New York. In 2002, he graduated with honors from the School of Visual Arts in New York City with a BFA in illustration and received his master's in art education from Lehman College. His award-winning sports work has appeared in juried shows and museums nationwide, as well as having been featured in nationally distributed books, newspapers, magazines, and both internet and television featurettes. To Greg, no other sport embodies the relationship between generations and the sense of community like baseball. His goal is to portray the national pastime in an era when players were accessibly human and the atmosphere of a cozy ballpark was just as important as what happened on the field. He's proud to act as a visual historian, recreating a history that he has never experienced, yet, like millions of fans, maintains a profound connection with. And that's the thing that makes me love his work so much. He's not just painting. He's bringing these old photos that sometimes we've seen a million times or sometimes we've never seen them before at all, from black and white to a brilliantly realistic colorized form. But what sets him apart from other artists who are doing similar things is his level of research, his attention to detail. Greg hunts through hundred-year-old newspapers to try to find a single reference to what exact shade of blue a uniform might have been, or what color the seats in a stadium were, or what somebody's true eye color was. And the end result is an image that is as close to perfect as anyone has seen since the original photograph was taken. In this episode, we cover lots of ground. Greg tells us how Bob Feller responded when he saw the painting of his opening day no-hitter in 1940. We learn who Greg got in touch with to find out if the lights were on at the polo grounds when Bobby Thompson hit the shot heard around the world, because that's how much he cares that his paintings are truly accurate. We find out why, to Greg, it's not just the superstars, but also the utility players, the managers, and even the bat boys who make up the fabric of the game. And we learn the difference between an artist's color study and a fully realized painting. With all of that information and much, much more coming at you, it may be helpful to follow along with the episode's liner notes on our website. You'll still be able to enjoy the interview without the extra help, but sometimes when I'm listening to things like this, I like to really go in-depth, so I've provided some photos and links to give you all a better understanding of the things that Greg and I are discussing. Those liner notes can be found at the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum website, which is online at www.shoelessjoejackson.org. So if you want to follow along, head over to the museum's website and click on the podcast tab at the top. You can also just head to shoelessjoejackson.org slash shoelesspodcast, and it will take you right there, where you can click on the Greg Kreinler episode or any past episode you may want to catch up on. Everything in the liner notes goes in chronological order of how we talked about them in the interview, so you should be able to easily keep your place as you listen. At the end of the episode, I'll explain how you can answer a trivia question on Twitter to win a copy of the Topps baseball card featuring one of Greg's paintings of Babe Ruth, so stick around until the end of the episode for that. Um, Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Greg's work has been featured in a set of Topps baseball cards. The Topps 150 Years of Baseball set was released over the course of 2019, and by the time it was over, Greg's work made up 20 of the 150 cards in the set. How cool is that? The winner of last week's trivia contest was Aaron, who, after listening to the Mike Miller episode of My Baseball History, correctly answered on Twitter that Joe Jackson got his famous nickname of Shoeless in a game against Anderson. Aaron, shoot me a DM on Twitter at Shoeless Podcast with your mailing address and I'll send you your prizes. Back to this week's episode with Greg. We recorded this interview at the convention center in Rosemont, Illinois during the National Card Convention in 2019. There's a little background noise of people walking around and talking, which is something I've tried to stay away from for most of these interviews, but this chat with Greg is incredibly enlightening and well worth your time. He's a brilliant artist, an incredibly intelligent person, and an extraordinary researcher. Since this interview was recorded... Greg's exhibit at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum opened in Kansas City. I was there for the opening reception, and it was such an incredible experience to see the 228 portraits Greg painted over a three-year period leading up to the exhibit. You heard that right, 228 paintings. One of the pieces of memorabilia at that exhibit, which was curated by Jay Caldwell and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, was the Negro National League financial ledger that Rube Foster used from 1917 to 1925. Just an invaluable piece of history, and something that has filled in the holes of many of the questions surrounding how the league was established and operated. 
As far as our own museum is concerned, we're closed for the time being as we wait for the move and for the construction of our addition, but that doesn't mean that we haven't been busy. We're always trying to acquire new pieces for the museum and getting new displays lined up and planned out for when we're ready to safely open again. Just this past week, I drove down to Florida and picked up a complete set of the exact china pattern Joe and Katie used in their kitchen when they lived in the house that is now the museum. I had been searching for the past couple years trying to find a complete set, and while there were individual pieces available here and there, I was never able to find the whole thing. The way I even knew what I should be looking for is because we've had a few of the pieces from the set on display at the museum for years, but this is the first time we'll be able to put everything out and make the kitchen look as accurate as it has since the Jacksons lived there in the 50s. We have many goals at the museum, but one of them is certainly to try to make the experience for our visitors as true and informative as possible. If you have any memorabilia that you think can help us do that and want to loan or donate it to the museum, you can either reach out through the contact form on the donate tab of our website, or you can send me an email to shoelessmuseum at gmail.com and we'll work something out. Okay, I think that's enough updates. Now, here's my interview with renowned baseball artist Greg Kreinler. I read that you got your inspiration to start drawing by looking at your dad's old baseball cards growing up. Yeah, yeah, that that is correct. Uh, my dad was born in 1944, uh, in uh, you know a New Yorker his whole life, and uh, he collected baseball cards like most kids his age, and uh, like most kids his age, his mother threw out those baseball cards eventually. So you know they're horror stories of mm-hmm. what he lost, but they're. There was a batch of cards that he was able to hold on to. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it was because he stopped his mother or his mother missed them or something. But anyway, he kept on, uh, he, you know, he held those cards and, and held on to them. Uh, to this day, he still has them. And I discovered them when I was a little kid. And, uh, you know, these are, you know, the late 40s, early 50s, Bowman and Topps issues. So they are for the most part illustrated so yeah. they're not they're not done from photography and you know at that age i was i was drawing i was drawing you know like gi joe and like he-man and stuff like that because that's what i was into mm-hmm. uh and maybe something kind of clicked in my head where it's like oh you know someone drew this baseball card maybe i could do something like that not necessarily as like a vocation but uh just as something to do something that was different yeah so that's kind of how i think it started how it germinated and here i am so were you born with artistic ability or did you learn that and where do you fall on that debate do you think do you think that is an innate ability or do you think you can be taught i it's it's a little bit of both i think you i think that you need to have a little bit of talent like it can just be like a tiny you know, spark, and it's kind of up to you to to work and and learn and fan it into a flame. Um, I I really think that talent is overrated. Is not the right word, but it I don't know. It's kind of like a, a misnomer. You know, if people see that you're a good artist or good at anything, really. You know, you you, know, you say you have a God given talent or something. I, I think that you do to an extent, but I think you've also worked you know, tirelessly to get wherever it is you are Mm -hmm. and hopefully continue to work. Yeah. Or at least that's kind of how I have always thought of it. Yeah. Um, So you graduated from the School of Visual Arts in New York. And I'm just curious, like when you enrolled there, what did you think you wanted to do when you graduated? What, What did you hope to be? So I went into the School of Visual Arts thinking that I was going to be a book cover illustrator. Uh, mostly, I, I wasn't even I wasn't doing any baseball art or anything like that at the time. Uh, I was kind of focusing on like science fiction and fantasy uh, related stuff because that was kind of the imagery that I, I guess, was always attracted to. I mean, I had always been into comic books and I had always been into fantasy and sci-fi movies. I didn't necessarily read the literature a lot, but I loved I loved the imagery. 
Uh, so that was kind of where I thought I was going to end up. I'd say maybe a year or year and a half into it, I realized that it wasn't really for me. It didn't really, didn't really tug at my heartstrings, I guess. And I, I guess I, I kind of, I don't know if floundered is the right word, but I just, I tried some different things and I, I tried to kind of experiment a little and just kind of go down different paths and see if anything clicked or clicked better. Eventually, uh, I think kind of like circuitously, I, I kind of came to baseball, which is also a long story, which I could tell you if you want. Um, it's a podcast. It's a podcast. So. That's great. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, <laughs> so my senior year of school there, if you're a senior, you know, in any one of your disciplines, you have a portfolio class and in this portfolio class you're basically well you're building a portfolio that you are hoping to kind of you know shop out to, to galleries or to get commercial work or whatever in this particular class my teacher would give general assignments you know stuff that we could just kind of use as a launch pad to take wherever we wanted to go uh, one of the assignments that he gave us was to illustrate a relationship and I, I don't know if it was the first thing that I thought of, but uh, I, I kind of gravitated towards the idea of the relationship between a pitcher and a batter. And, you know, at that time I hadn't really done any baseball-related artwork since I was a kid. I mean, since I was copying, you know, my father's baseball cards. So I figured that, you know, if I'm going to do a quote-unquote mature baseball painting, then maybe I would do it of Mickey Mantle who was my dad's hero, still mm -hmm. is my dad's hero, or one of his heroes, uh, and, you know, maybe give it to him as a gift. <clears throat> and my, you know, my dad, who grew up idolizing him, like so many people of his generation, you know, when I would draw Mickey for him as a young kid, he would always say that, you know, he liked the drawing or whatever, and I did a good job, but if the likeness was off or something looked weird, he would always tell me, you know, much to my chagrin as a young kid, you know, I'd go back into my room and cry or whatever. I didn't really take criticism that well, but, uh, it, it kind of built, uh, this, at least when it came to baseball, for sure, it built this kind of tough skin that, uh, that I guess was responsible for me, uh, feeling that, that if I was going to paint Mickey Mantle or anyone like that, it had to look like Mickey Mantle. It had to, you know, if it was him at bat, it had to be his batting stance. If it was him batting in a certain stadium during a certain year, the ballpark had to look the way it looked that year. You know, the colors had to be right. The, you know, the, the time of day had to be right. I wasn't necessarily thinking that my father was going to, like, you know, call me out on it mm -hmm. because he, I'd like to think he wouldn't remember some of those details. Maybe he would. <laughs> But uh, he's like, that's not the advertisement exactly. that was on the left field wall. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, you know, I'm in therapy for 10 <laughs> years because of that. Uh, but I, I just knew that he he would appreciate me getting it right. Yeah. And maybe that was kind of ingrained in me from then on to kind of make sure it was right. Yeah. I mean, I also knew that that baseball fans are pretty anal about that sort of thing, which obviously, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't want to ever necessarily be called out on something that I did wrong or or something that didn't look right. So, you know, I decided I would do this painting. It would be Mickey Mantle. I picked what the scene was going to look like, the composition, who he was facing, what team it was, what stadium it was, what day it was, when the game took place, what the light was like, you know, what the advertisements looked like. And I researched my butt off. And um, I enjoyed it more than like anything I had ever done. Um, Beats the hell out of a bowl of fruit. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there's nothing nothing wrong with painting a still life of flowers or whatever. I mean, it's considered high art by the art world, and that's totally cool. Uh, but I was just happy, you know, painting something that I that I vibed with, yeah. and something that I that I just enjoyed working with. And uh, I, I did the painting, and my, my father loved it, and it was, um, it was a successful piece in that when we would bring the pieces into the class, you'd get critiqued or whatever. I got critiqued by the professor and the other students, and you know they all had a lot of positive things to say about it, and it was received pretty well. 
And from there, I thought it might be a good piece to submit to the Society of Illustrators, which is, it's kind of like the hub of the world of illustration in New York, where, you know, a lot of professionals go and they have their work shown there in, in, in their annuals and the annuals that they put out go to art directors throughout the city, throughout the world, really. Mm-hmm. And that's how a lot of these art directors pick, you know, who's going to do a book cover for them or whatever. So, you know, these are great, like, directories to kind of put yourself out into the commercial world. And I, I thought maybe the piece could possibly get into something. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had a, a student competition, which at the time I was a student, so I submitted it, and it got in. And at the time, one of my main goals was to get into that show when I was in school. And I was like, all right, then I feel like I've, not that I've made it, but I accomplished something. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I got in, and that was like legitimizing, I guess, what I was doing. Definitely, yeah. So after that, you know, I, I kind of thought, okay, maybe there's something to this. And, you know, I kind of ran with it, I guess. I've heard you compare your process to method acting. <laughs> yeah. What, yeah. Uh, what do you mean by that? You know, it, it goes back to, to, what, uh, to what I mentioned about trying to kind of recreate these scenes as accurately as possible so I I get I guess I just get carried away with being accurate and I try to take it to you know the most extreme degree that I can take it so so this particular this particular painting uh, the one that I did of, of Mantle for my dad it was I think think I could be wrong it's been a long time but uh, I think that the image that I created was from the 52 World Series and uh, it was from a game at Ebbets Field Mm -hmm. and I was kind of thinking okay I have the year I have the ballpark what happened during this game you know did he hit a home run okay that's one thing what did in this in this composition you can see kind of you know the advertisements in in right field the wall what did those advertisements look like? Mm-hmm. Uh, what color were they? Uh, what time of day did he hit this home run? What was the weather like? You know, in this case, it was a it was a bright sunny day. So, where would the shadows from the players kind of fall, and the shadows of the grandstands from Ebbets Field? You know, would it would it kind of creep over the infield and cover just Mantle? Would it kind of cover everything plus the pitcher? Mm-hmm. And as I kind of looked into that stuff, I, I, I tried to kind of figure out why these things looked the way they did. So, like, why, like, what would differentiate an October afternoon at Ebbets Field on a sunny day from an April afternoon, a sunny day at Ebbets Field, you know, yeah. kind of taking the, into consideration, you know, the angle of the sun and how that changes the angle of the shadows throughout the day and what parts of the field get covered from shadow, you know, in April that don't get covered in October. And I guess I just, I still to this day, I get carried away with it. And I, I try to create, this sounds kind of corny, but I, I try to create a window into the past. So if somebody's looking at my painting, I, I, I want them to kind of, you know, I want them to feel like they're there. I want them to say, okay, you know, that, you know, that's a spring day at, at Ebbets Field or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I remember going to games when, you know, when the sun was beating down like that. And I remember the, the stands looking like that. And, and you know, the, the, the signs, the advertisement signs looking like that, having that color, you know, talking about like botany ties or Van Houston shirts. All of that stuff just became like an integral part of the research process. Yeah. And it still kind of remains that. I mean, you know, there, there are paintings that I do now that kind of incorporate that stuff. And sometimes I'm able to kind of find the, the smoking gun that I need to make that reference real to, so that I know that I did it correctly. Mm-hmm. You know, like that sign is yellow, you know, those letters are red or whatever, and they have a, a navy trim on them. But other times I have to guess. You know, I have to make educated guesses from maybe just looking around and, and looking at uh, looking at old advertisements for some of this stuff, like how it appeared in, in the 1910s or 1920s, mm-hmm. and making color decisions based on what I see in those. Yeah, It's like when I do paintings that involve that stuff and I'm not as sure with that stuff as I am with other paintings, it's 
you know, it becomes hard because it's like the, it's the method acting, but it's almost like I'm not doing it as well with those pieces as I'm doing it with others. Mm-hmm. Or maybe, maybe I just feel like that because I'm really neurotic. Um, but also, if you don't have the ability, you know, like some of the pieces that you've done are from players that haven't played in over 100 years. Right. And you don't have a first source document. You know, you don't have a jersey that they wore. Right. So you can say, okay, well, this is maroon, clearly. Right. And you don't, there, you know, color photography <coughs> didn't exist. Right. So you're still, you know, you're doing as much research as you possibly can. That's, to me, you know, that is the hardest thing about what you do is, yeah, anybody can say, oh, Yankee Stadium was green in this year. Right, right. But who knows what color some ball field in the Dominican Republic in 1884 was, you know? How are you making those guesses and making it look so real when people look at it and they're like, that's what it was like, man? You know, I think it it comes back to being neurotic, (laughs) as silly as it sounds. I did, so I did a a painting of of Hannes Wagner uh, about 10 years ago, and uh, it's depicting uh, uh, West Side Park in Chicago, Mm -hmm. and I, I... did a lot of research. I, I, you know, went through a ton of microfilm from newspapers of the day, just trying to see if I could find any information about what the color of this particular ballpark looked like. And, you know, eventually I found the smoking gun. Like I said, I, I, I found out what color it was, according to these newspaper people. Mm-hmm. And I painted it as such, and I, I felt confident that I had made the right decision because of that. And yet, still, there's a part of me that thinks, you know, maybe one day... I might be somewhere and I'm talking about the painting in front of a couple of people or maybe a, a lot of people if I'm lucky enough. And in is going to like, you know, hobble in like a 130 a year old man <laughs> with a cane saying, I was there that day and, you know, you got this wrong. Yeah, that's and not the right shade. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's like I just figure someone is always going to call me out on it. You know, I, has I, that it, happened yet? There have been, there've been a couple of times when when somebody has mentioned that they thought that I did something wrong and this sounds, you know, kind of mean, but in fact, you know, it was just, they were wrong. Uh-huh. And I was right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I, I did a painting of uh, Carl Hubble a long time ago mm-hmm. and it was from the 1937 when the giants were wearing these, uh, you know, the trim was just completely baby blue instead right. of the traditional, you know, black and orange. Yeah. And someone was like, Oh, well, you know, the Giants never wore that color. Actually, they did, and I have proof of it, and I'm a jerk, but yeah. I'm sorry. I did a lot of research, so I have right. to I That's have to That's why the I card. painted it that way. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> I am that jerk. Deep down, you know, that's got to feel good, though, to it, tell. <laughs> it does, but I, 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 I do feel like a jerk. <laughs> because I don't want to, like, correct someone, you mm-hmm. know, and I don't want to, like, shatter any memory or whatever that they have. Mm-hmm. Not that they're taking what I do, you know, to heart yeah. as much as something that could shatter, you know, those precious memories. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I am. I don't know. But I just, I feel bad. <laughs> I don't. I don't ever want to like make anyone feel bad or, or feel, you know, like they're wrong. Uh-huh. Um, but they're wrong, and they should feel bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're clearly a perfectionist in your art. Are you that way in your personal life? Is, is it, do you flip a switch when you're not working, or are you just constantly like, nope, it needs to be facing this way. It need, you know. Um, that's a great question. Thank uh, you. I. <laughs> Yeah, that it's a hard thing to turn off. Yeah. It really is. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't strive for perfectionism in, in everything. I mean, in, in my relationships and in my life in general. I think I'm more mindful of real life not being perfect and trying to be easy on myself when something doesn't go, you know, whatever is perfect in my head. But it's... It's hard. It's very hard. My brain is just wired, and I, it, it might it might be because of the art. It might be my obsessive personality. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, my brain is definitely wired that way. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it for the kind of work that I do, it lends itself pretty well to it. Absolutely. Even if I still feel like I fall short, you know, with each with each painting, like it can always be better and it can always be improved upon. I, I really I try to cut myself some slack with it when it comes to real life. Are you a fan of music? Like, yeah, so absolutely. 
have you ever talked to a band after a concert and they'll say, I mean, I missed up uh, the second chorus of the third song. Right, absolutely. And, and they're the only ones in the whole room that knew that they did that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what's happening with your artwork. You know, you see the two brushstrokes that were not perfect, and everybody else sees the million that are perfect. I mean, I, I really, I really appreciate that, and I, I'm absolutely flattered. But still, my perfect head <laughs> thinks like, but no, those two. Yeah, <laughs> these people don't know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Like one of my. Not one of my, my favorite band. I don't know if this is going to alienate some of your listeners or all of them or maybe ingratiate myself. I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm a big deadhead, so I love the Grateful Dead. Cool. And they're you know they were notoriously hard on themselves, all of them, for you know playing a bad show or playing a bad set or you know, a bad song, you know, or maybe a solo or something like that didn't work out well or the groove was wrong. And yet, like you mentioned, you know the people who hear it you know think that they just walk on water Mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that people think i walk on water because then then they'd really be crazy (laughs) but it's you just need to convince all of your fans to do hard psychedelic drugs every time they want to experience your art that would be great (laughs) 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 that would be that's like a dream (laughs) we can i'll make some calls i think we can make that happen (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean you know and i live in new york so I, i I got to imagine that, you know, I can find They're available? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can find psychedelics if I need to. Uh, so you definitely paint modern athletes in modern situations, but most of your work seems to be like pre-1970s. Yeah. Um, what draws you to that time period? Why, why is that what you focus on? I think that I'm attracted to that era or the eras before, you know, 1970 or 1960 because... I think everybody just knows it as this black and white world. Uh, people who are my father's age, my dad is going to be 75 this year. People like him who got to see Mickey Mantle and, and Willie Mays and those guys like playing the flesh. I think that they understand that you know the world back then was just as colorful as it is now. But people my age, I'm you know I'm going to be 40 next year, unfortunately. I think you know when you see people my age see a, a, a photograph of Mickey Mantle or go back further, you know, Babe Ruth or Gehrig or even back into the 19th uh, century, it's black and white. Mm-hmm. It's this drab world. And I think being able to kind of work in color and bring those guys back to life or attempt to bring them back to life, I think that it shows people something different. You know, especially considering when you watch baseball today, if somebody somebody hits a home run if you're watching a game on television you're seeing them hit that home run you know from 30 different camera angles so color is not an issue you know you're seeing it it's everywhere it's like it's so much more i guess the ubiquity of of the game is it's just it's it's different than it was back then even though back then you know baseball and and even other sports they were more of a focal point of society it's just that we didn't have the same I guess technological access to it that we do now and me painting those guys who I guess we know as black and white players and making them or trying to make them real that just appeals a lot more to me uh, than painting you know Barry Bonds or something even though I really want to paint Barry Bonds (laughs) but that's you know neither here nor there no I totally agree and you know one of the things that your your work does to me is it humanizes them you know oh, otherwise you. they're just a a dead guy in a history book right right and when you see somebody in color and you see somebody with piercing blue eyes and you're like whoa this was a person right who exactly. like who lived a life yeah. and it w- not just a baseball player you know this was a a man or in some cases a, a child right. you know because uh, You've talked a lot about painting Mickey Mantle and you know painting Hall of Famers and All Stars, but one of the things I love about your work is that you focus on other people too. And yeah. I've literally seen you do a painting of the Bat Boy from the Yankees yes. in the nineteen twenties <laughs> and thirties, Eddie Bennett. Oh, yeah, Eddie right? Bennett. Yeah. Like, <laughs> why are you painting stuff like that? It's that to me. That's what sets you apart. Anybody can paint Mickey Mantle. We've yeah. all seen a million pictures of him. You are. 
finding these people who nobody knows about right. and bringing them back to life. And to me, that's what makes your, your work special. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. That's one of my favorite parts about this stuff because, you know, like you mentioned, anyone can paint Mickey Mantle. And, you know, for so many people, Mickey Mantle is baseball, and he is baseball. But baseball, the history of the game is just such a... I, I say that it's, you know, this large tapestry, and, you know, every thread of that tapestry is important. I mean sure one player might be a better player than the other guys but you know it's a team thing and it's like these guys are important um eddie bennett you know in this particular case i, I have a client who he's a big yankee fan a big uh, 27 yankee fan mm-hmm. and he loves eddie bennett's story you know the fact that he's this mascot bat boy he was like a hunchback and you know he was kind of like orphaned and he has like this tragic tale of like drinking himself to death and yeah and like that stuff appeals to me because like you said you know these are real people and you know again it sounds kind of corny but it's like you know i try to i try to think of their feelings uh and you know what life must have been like for them you know in the 20s or 30s or the 1800s mm-hmm. and and you know how how different it was how hard it might have been that stuff is important i think when you keep that in mind and if you're able to kind of imbue it uh or if i'm able to kind of imbue it into what i'm doing then i feel like it gives those guys a bit of humanity and i think it kind of gives them the respect that i think they deserve i mean if you're if you're a baseball player in the 40s if you're just kind of like a, a role player or maybe even someone who's not playing that often you know you, chances are you're probably not going to make it with a team now obviously now athletes are a lot better off than they were then yeah but back then you know those guys were important and you know those guys within the clubhouse within the team you know it was like a family and and I try to think that, like, one guy, that no no player is more important than the other, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. But straddling that with the idea that I do this for a living, and, you know, obviously I, I'm really grateful when I'm able to sell my work, and mm-hmm. if people buy it, that's, that's amazing. And people are still more attracted to the Mickey Mantles and the Babe Ruths. I, I feel like if I'm able to kind of sell a painting of Eddie Bennett or... Uh, you know, a player that no one has ever heard of that I just happened to think had a really interesting face. Like, that's great. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, there's something, there's something powerful about that. Not, yeah. not powerful, you know, to me and like, oh, I have power, but that's, that's the power of, of art. And, you know, that, that's what makes it kind of like this transcendent thing. Yeah. Uh, and being able to kind of tap into that sometimes is, it's amazing. Uh, if I can do it, that is. Who are some of your influences in the art world, uh, whether they are current artists or from years past? When it comes to the people who are no longer living, um, I some of my biggest influences were uh, some of the illustrators uh, from the uh, the golden age of like American illustration. People like Norman Rockwell, uh, Dean Cornwell, Howard Pyle. Uh, people who were telling stories with their with their artwork uh some of them might have been you know better painters than others but they were concerned with the narrative Mm -hmm. and and picture making and those guys i mean i learned a ton from uh john singer Sargent is a big favorite some of his contemporaries like andrew zorn and joaquin soroya I, i love um one of my biggest influences uh, is a guy who's currently uh, living, thankfully. Uh, he was actually a teacher of mine at the School of Visual Arts, a guy named Peter Fiore. And Peter, uh, Peter now is like a dear friend. It's like one of my most uh, treasured friendships that I, I think I've ever had. Uh, he was an illustrator, a commercial illustrator for... Uh, you know about 25 30 years and his artwork focused on creating a mood through light and color 
and he kind of taught me how to kind of look at the world in that same way how how light can shape things how light can create emotion how color can create emotion and now to this day like he still does that he's a uh, he focuses now just on, on landscape painting, mm-hmm. but the way he handles a brush, you know, just his, the, like the calligraphy of his strokes, just his, his visual language, we mm-hmm. say, is just something I've always been completely enamored with. And just how he thinks about the creation of his work and how he thinks about light and color, I have just been super attracted to that. And I've, I've learned so much from him. And I think without him, I, I mean, I would not be able to do what I do without him, without, without knowing him, without learning from him. Like artistically, I think he's been, he's definitely my biggest influence. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely apparent in your work, uh, the way that you navigate shadows and lighting and your work isn't just slapped together. You know, you can no, tell that well, it, is, it is thought about and dissected from every point of view. Uh, yeah, 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 and that's all... That's all him. I mean, I, in a way, it's like he kind of he kind of helped me fall in love with the craft of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when I was when I was doing uh, the sci-fi fantasy stuff, I wasn't in love with it. It was it was more of, of a formulaic kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And through him, I was able to kind of fall in love with it in a totally different way, in a more uh, mature way. And, you know, still, like to this day, like I said, he's one of my most treasured friends and he's, he's the best. I love the guy. Uh, a lot of your pieces are based on photographs. Um, are there certain photographers that you find are the reference work for a lot of your pieces? Like, do you notice the same names popping up? Like, oh, this guy has a lot of pieces that I'm trying to recreate. Uh, yeah, I, definitely. They're some of the bigger names in... Uh, in photography or in terms of baseball photography uh, from the dead ball era people you know like Charles Conlon um, uh, George Burke to a lesser extent but uh, yeah, Charles Conlon uh, George Grantham Bain um, Paul Thompson those guys I, I definitely gravitate towards their work there there are also a lot of uh, photographers lesser known guys who uh, names I don't even know people who worked for local uh, local papers so like there's I don't know if this is if it's one photographer or if it's many photographers but uh, there there's a ton of imagery from uh, the dead ball era actually available at the Chicago History Museum uh, a lot of it which was shot I think for the Chicago Daily News and you know it's never listed like who these photographers are mm-hmm. but but you know they're they're photographing you know Hannes Wagner in 1903 and you know Napoleon Lajoie in 1903 and you know the quality of the imagery is amazing um, you know the the clarity of the photography is usually beautiful and you know they're showing um, you know action scenes that you don't normally see yeah it's kind of like I feel that I, I I turn to to those guys that I you know. The, the work that I find at the Chicago History Museum a lot, but uh, definitely also those people like Conlin and, and Bain and Thompson. I, I've seen so many images in, you know, over the past 15 years or however long I've been doing this, and I've become very familiar with these photographers and I guess their aesthetic mm-hmm. and, and what, they, what they look for in their own photography. I mean, even if they're not treating it as something artistic, if it was just like a job, like it was for, you know, for Conlon, I guess... They still have I, their own voice, though. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. I, and I, I think I, I kind of just gravitate towards whatever image speaks to me, mm-hmm. in a way. And, you know, that can be an expression, that could be, you know, quality of light, that could be a ballpark in the background. It just varies from piece to piece, I guess. Interesting. You do these color studies that are normally like five inches by seven inches. Is right. that normally right? Okay. Yep. What is the purpose of those pieces uh, and what happens to them when you're done with them? Well, the color studies, uh, normally what, uh, what a painter or, or any artist actually might do is it's, it's kind of like preparatory work. So for me, what I do is I'll, I'll do the drawing of, let's say if I'm doing you know, a painting of Ernie Banks or something, uh, like a larger painting, 
uh, I will usually just, I'll start off with a small, like a five by seven uh, study of him, where it'll be the same kind of image for the most part. And I will, I'll treat it as kind of my playtime where I put it up on the easel and I'm just trying to kind of experiment with things. Uh, you know, whether that, whether that's in relation to color uh, or, you know, value structure or something. It's, it's to kind of give myself a better feel uh, for the subject and to kind of go into the fully realized painting mm -hmm. uh, with, I guess, a better idea of what I'm doing. It's just part of my prep work. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually, I, you know, these were things that I just kind of did for myself. It was just part of the process for each painting. And it, it uh, years ago, it just so happened that I guess I, I don't remember if I showed them to somebody randomly or maybe they had asked if I had done any preliminary sketches or anything. Mm -hmm. And I showed it to them and, and they really liked it and they wanted to buy them. Um, and I kind of realized, okay, well, you know, this... This is something that I can offer to collectors as well. You know, if they if they don't want to buy a larger piece, if they maybe want to get a couple of smaller ones or mm -hmm. maybe one smaller one, you know, at a lower price, then this is something that I can offer to them. Cool. So, you know, it started off as just kind of being something that was part of my process, but now is, I guess, part of my business model, mm -hmm. which is a weird thing to say or admit in public. But <laughs> it, I guess, you know, I never thought of... That that would be another source of income. Yeah, exactly. It was just part of your prep work. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and and since I'm I'm really lucky in that people like my work and uh, you know some of them like to buy it and I understand that it's expensive and you know owning a painting is a luxury mm -hmm. and you know it's like you have to have a certain amount of discretionary income to buy it I guess which is what you need to buy baseball cards mm -hmm. so <laughs> you know some people don't want to pay those prices right. for paintings which is totally understandable and totally fine so you instead know, they'd rather go to Starbucks every morning and spend $14 on <laughs> that's fine too <laughs> uh, that's fine too but you know also you know if you can give them an option of still having your work uh, having an original mm -hmm. you know for a, for I guess a, a more minimal fee yeah. then some of them really dig that um, I guess especially since I don't since I don't do reproductions. Yeah. So that's I guess another way for someone to own what I do. So you're not just an artist. Many people consider you a historian. Do you view yourself <laughs> that way? Uh, I do to an extent. I mean, I, I like to think of myself as kind of like a visual historian. You know, especially you know when it comes to things like uniforms and, and ballparks. I don't want to say that I'm unique in that sense, but I. I guess that's my area of expertise. Uh, whereas, you know, some people, I guess, are kind of like stat heads and, and saber people. Uh, or, you know, if you're like John Thorne and you know everything. Um, he does know everything. <laughs> he does. He's wonderful. Not just about baseball either. Oh, he's, he, yeah. He's, he's something else. Yes. I love that guy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I guess that, that would kind of be my... That's your lane? My domain. Yeah. Yeah. But even then, you know, I'm, I'm still learning. I... You know, it's like everything is kind of a learning experience, and I always try to stick more information in my brain. You know, how much of it actually stays or sticks is debatable, but uh, I know a lot of esoteric stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's why you put it on the canvas, you know? It, yeah. You might not remember it all off the top of your head, but if it, if it winds up in your work, then you knew it at one point. Right, at some point. Even yeah, though I've you forgotten. know that the Giants wore baby blue. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. And at some point, I'll probably forget it. But just like that old man did. Exactly. <laughs> Thankfully, I have books and you know and and other things to remind me. Yeah. But uh, that's kind of where my head is at. It's just filled with you know useless facts like that. <laughs> useless facts and also just imagery, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So when you set out on this journey to be a baseball artist when you decided like okay that's what I'm gonna do what was your intention like did you want to be you know a researcher a historian did you want to document the history of the game what what was your idealized version of your goal you know what it it didn't really involve well maybe it did I what I mentioned before about the tapestry of the game yeah depicting that as as best as I could, as honestly as I could, um, in a way that wasn't glorifying these guys, 
and glorifying maybe isn't the right phrase, but uh, deifying. Actually, I don't know if deifying works either. But <laughs> you know, well, that's the only other word I know. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, Same we're here. in trouble here. <laughs> um, you know, here this 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 will break it down. So there's this story about um, about Red Barber. Uh, about when when Branch Rickey told him that Jackie Robinson was uh, going to be signed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Red Barber came from the South. I think he came from Florida. Uh, you know, he went to segregated schools, and and I think he initially was a bit uncomfortable with the idea of the Dodgers having an African American player. And, you know, he kind of wondered how he was going to be able to do his job uh, because he felt this way. Uh, And supposedly, you know, he talked to his wife about this and his wife said, you know, it's not something you have to worry about now. Why don't you just have a cocktail and relax? And and he stated, uh, Barber said that he thought about it and he was taken back to his first World Series, which was in uh, 1935. Uh, that was the first one he covered. And uh, he and, I guess, all of the local reporters or announcers or whatever were brought into a room with uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And Landis kind of broke it down for the, for these reporters, saying that, you know, your job here is to report. You know, if a player does something that, you know, you don't like or whatever, you know, leave your opinions in your hotel room I think was the phrase your job is to report Mm -hmm. and apparently Barber thought about Robinson in that way for the first time then and I'm not you know I'm not saying that Barber was a racist or anything like that but I think that it just took him that realization that his job was to report on what he was seeing Mm -hmm rather than giving his opinions. Mm -hmm. I think that's what kind of took the weights off of his shoulder and he was kind of able to better do his job. So, on that note, I kind of feel like my job is kind of similar in that I kind of want to visually report what has happened in the game. Mm -hmm. Originally, somebody had asked me if I ever felt weird about painting, you know, Ty Cobb because he was considered a, a, a racist, you know, up until... Uh, Charles Learson's book came out and we realized that he wasn't really a racist. He was just a bit intense. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I I kind of like the idea of painting people like Cobb and painting, uh, you know, Jake Powell, who was a racist or, you know, is considered a racist because he's as much a part of, of the tapestry of the game as any of these other guys mm-hmm. are. And, you know, that's what kind of life was like back then. That if was, not more so, yeah. because they literally kept people away from Absolutely. their game. Absolutely. So, yeah, people like Cap Anson. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. I mean, Anson is a, you know, you talk about him now, and most people think he's a deplorable figure, and sure, maybe he is, but you know what? I, that's not going to prevent me from painting him, mm-hmm. because he's a part of the baseball story. Yeah. Uh, so it was my goal to kind of, to kind of you know leave the opinions in my hotel room yeah. and paint everybody who I thought had an interesting story. Um, in addition to that, it was also you know hopefully making a living off of what I was doing because <laughs> I loved it so much. Yeah. So it was basically those two things more than anything else. So when you uh, when you painted the shot heard around the world, you actually reached out to and got a response from Bobby Thompson. Yes. Yes, I did. You were trying to figure out if the lights at the polo grounds were on when he hit the the pitch from Ralph Branca. Yes. So, like, okay, first of all, hi, you're definitely a historian. <laughs> <laughs> or, you, or a weirdo. If you haven't admitted that to yourself yet, come to grips with it. Okay. You are. Uh, that's going above and beyond to make your piece accurate. But let's talk about one, like, how do you get their contact information? The, when, you're, when you're reaching out to people... <clears throat> Who is putting you in touch? You can't, you know, Bobby Thompson doesn't have a Twitter account. No. How no. do you find these people and and what is their response when you're like, hey, remember 70 years ago when you hit a home run? Do you remember if the lights were on? Yeah. Yeah, so at the time, 
it, it worked out for me in that, you know, this was 2002. It was before Twitter. It was before a lot of social media. And I knew, I guess, you know, from, uh, from whatever research I had done on, you know, baseball cards and the hobby or whatever, I knew that he was a generous, you know, through the mail autograph guy. Mm-hmm. So I figured, okay, I have this question. Why don't I write him? Maybe he'll write me back. And maybe he'll know. Um, so I was able to get his address from somebody. I don't remember who. Uh, but I wrote him a long letter. And, you know, I, I, knew, I knew damn well that, like, as I'm writing him this tome of a letter, that this was probably one of the more crazy letters that he would receive, uh-huh. you know, on a, on a normal basis. And uh, two, three weeks later, I hear back from him. <laughs> you know, he sends my letter back, and he just... He wrote at the bottom of it, I believe the lights were on. Bobby Thompson. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it's like, that's incredible. That is incredible. But at the same time, I get that back and I'm thinking, well, you know, Bobby Thompson's in his 80s. <laughs> he could be wrong. He might be a little <laughs> bit senile. So do I trust him? Uh, but I did trust him and I put the lights on mm-hmm. and I discovered later that the lights were on. Yes, they so were. So I felt good. <laughs> I felt good about that. But... Uh, you know, I knew damn well that it was a very strange request, and I, I was lucky that he responded to me. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. So even though fans can see and hear players on TV and in press conferences or interviews before and after every game, and they can theoretically interact with players on social media at any given moment, do you feel like players are less accessible today than they were 50 years ago? I think so. Uh, well, yeah, you know what, that's a, that's a really good question. It's... You would think that they're more accessible because a lot of them do have Twitter accounts and, you know, you can have access to them in a way that you didn't have access to them back in the, in the golden eras. But, I, you know what, I think, I think there's still less access to them because there's such a great divide between, you know, the common person and, you know, celebrity culture, mm-hmm. which these, these guys are a part of. I mean, they're... They're superior athletes, and they get paid, you know, millions of dollars. Which, personally, I mean, I think that they deserve, considering all the money that they generate for I the agree. people who own the teams and everything. Fine, whatever. But, uh, yeah, I think that I think that they're a lot less accessible. Uh, you know, there's there's always the the tale about you know the the Brooklyn Dodger players who you know in the 40s and 50s lived in the neighborhood and right. you know you could go and chat with them after the game and you know see them on the subway or whatever you're not really doing that nowadays you right. certainly wouldn't see you know Derek Jeter on the subway right. um, at least I don't think you would <laughs> no <laughs> um, I mean, he makes you put your cell phone in a bowl when you walk into his house so <laughs> ridiculous I get yeah I guess Mickey Mantle wouldn't be doing that but I don't know it, it, it's it, it just seems like even with Twitter, those guys are so much uh, just at arm's length. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you can have a not even a conversation, but like an exchange with them, mm-hmm. they're still you know that they're still like they're You're not them. You right. don't you don't function the same way that they do. Right. Um, you know, for better or for worse. And even the interactions that you do have, they're putting on their public persona. Of course. It's, that's not them answering as them. Of that's course. them answering as their celebrity. Of course. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm glad that you agree with that. Yeah, no, 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 I, I absolutely do. I mean, you know, that was like one of the great things about, about Derek Jeter, speaking of him. Mm-hmm. You know, that he, press conference after a game, you know, people, uh, the reporters, the writers, beat writers would interview him, and he would spin these tales that you know, it was basically like killing time because he's telling these reporters something and giving them something to write, but in actuality, like the content of what he gave them, it was nothing. Right. He'd like talk to you for 10 minutes and he'd give you nothing. <laughs> and it's just, that's Derek Jeter's, that's the Derek Jeter that, that we know. You know, that's his persona. Right. As a real person, who knows what he is? Yeah. I mean... I will never know because I will never be in that circle. Right. I don't know if I want to be in that circle. <laughs> but You've painted a lot of subjects more than once, but um, have you ever painted the same literal image or have you painted the same moment from multiple different angles? Uh, both. Both. I, I actually, I, about 10 years ago, it was when I kind of 
instilled this policy where if somebody wanted a, a specific photograph painted, uh, that I would only do once. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, I painted, there were a few paintings that I did more than once. Mm-hmm. Um, like, uh, I did a painting of, uh, of Lou Gehrig's uh, Farewell, mm-hmm. uh, like a scene right before he made a speech. Uh, originally, I did a smaller painting of that for my brother. And then, you know, a couple of years later, I'm like, oh, well, you know, my, my abilities have, have changed a bit, and I, I'd like to see how I would handle this now. And so I did a larger version of it, but it was the same image. Yeah. Uh, but now I won't do that. Now it's just a, a one-off. Uh, but, yeah, I, I've done, you know, back to Gehrig, I've, I've done the farewell a couple of times from a couple of different angles. Cool. Um, so that's kind of like the way to make that happen now. Yeah. Your work around. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. It's like if a client, you know, I've I've painted, I painted the, uh, that famous Charles Conlon photo of, of Cobb sliding into third. I painted that for one client and there, you know, there are a ton of people who've come to me and they want me to redo it and, you know, make one for them. Mm -hmm. And and I'll always say, Oh, you know, I I can't, you know, I only do one of ones, but you know, if you want, I can find, you know, maybe another image of Cobb sliding yeah, somewhere yeah. on a different day or maybe the same day from a different angle. Yeah. But, you know, this one's been taken. So, you know, I, I, I like doing that because it keeps things fresh for me. But at the same time, you know, the person who bought the original painting, I feel like they appreciate, I guess, that they have something that's one of a kind. Yeah. And that sure. won't be duplicated. So do you have a spreadsheet of what you've painted or do you have a photographic memory where you're just like, nah, I mean, I spent hours on this thing. I know that I did this one. I I have both. I I definitely have a photographic memory of just image wise what I've done. Uh, The details of it, you know, get kind of sketchier as I get older, just like sizes and things like that. But I I, I do have a a spreadsheet that kind of keeps track of it. Um, And it also in the same spreadsheet, it keeps track of not only stuff that I've done, but stuff that I plan on doing. Okay. In addition to, you know, the sizes, you know, what even the titles of the paintings might be. Uh, I get kind of carried away with that stuff sometimes. I like that. So yeah. I was going to get to that later, but what are some of the things that you hope to work on at, at some point? Oh, my gosh. Everything I haven't done. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done a couple of team paintings mm-hmm. uh, over the past five or six years. I'd love to do more. I've done. Have you ever painted a baseball fight? No, I never have. I'd love to do that. I mean, I was thinking about that the other night with the yeah, Yasiel Puig with fight. With the Puig thing, yeah. That, you know, the the photographs that I'd seen of that, like some of those are just pieces of art in themselves. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know if anything that I could do could make them more artistic other than it being a painting. But hell, that would be fun to paint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there have been a couple of people who have joked about. Uh, commissioning me to do, you know, Nolan Ryan and Robin Ventura. <laughs> and that would be great. I well, would love that, that wasn't a fight because that was one-sided. It was very one-sided. <laughs> it was. It was more of just a beat down, I guess. <laughs> Who do you think you've painted the most times in your career? Uh, it's got to be Ruth. Yeah? Yeah, it's got to be Ruth. I, I think... Are those mostly commissions? Like, uh, is that because he, people yeah. just ask you for him all the time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ruth, Ruth is the most popular. Uh, there's always... There, there's so many different eras of Ruth's career that um, that uh, that make him interesting. Um, you know, whether he's you know with the Baltimore Orioles, or he's a young kid with the Red Sox, or he's a young skinny Yankee, or then a fat Yankee, and then an over the hill Yankee, and then a retiring Yankee, and and then a Boston and, Brave, and then a Boston Brave, <laughs> right? And I did I did a painting of him as a Boston Brave, which I I love uh-huh. because. Who the hell wants a painting of him, you know, with the Boston Braves? I do. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I get requested uh, for him more than anybody. Um, I think next is probably Gehrig. Uh, Interesting. Then, and then Mantle. It's yeah. usually, it's like the big, the big four with the Yankees. I think I do DiMaggio the least out of the big four. Mm-hmm. But Mantle, Gehrig, Ruth, those are the guys. Yeah. Um, so your your wait list is pretty long at this point. Yes. Yes. Thank, Our, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, that's a good problem to have. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm really blessed and incredibly grateful for it. Do you still have time to paint things for your own enjoyment, or is it literally just, I need to get through this and, and knock down the queue? Uh, it's more so that I need to get through the queue. Uh, there are a lot of clients that I have who have been waiting a very long time for their paintings, like there are a couple that have been waiting, you know, five or six years who 
are so so patient and understanding and god bless them yeah uh it's been it's been a little bit harder because i have two young children Mm -hmm. uh so they kind of you know keep my head on a swivel uh so most of my time goes to them um but uh every now and then i can fit in you know maybe an hour or two of doing something for myself Mm -hmm. and usually that'll be a player that nobody cares about Mm -hmm. or like three people care about Mm -hmm. Um, like over the past few weeks i spent a few hours on a painting of uh bill foster who uh was a a negro league pitcher Uh, he has a uh uh a card it's a baseball card from i think it's the mid early to mid 20s um it's called a, a mallorquina and it's just like a, a a portrait shot of him and i and uh you know it's a cuban baseball card and i, I found like uh, you know an original photograph of uh, that was used for this card and cool. you know, clarity is beautiful and i'm like i this is haunting i need to paint this yeah. i don't know if anyone wants a you know a bill foster painting but uh but you did. But I, I did. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'll take a few hours and I'll try to knock it out. Cool. So, yeah, when I can. It's rare, but but I try to. How do you keep things interesting for yourself on a daily basis? Like, are you exper- experimenting with new techniques or does the mental simulation come from the research that you're doing and then, you know, like the, the physical experiences, the painting? Uh, it stays fresh, thankfully, because of the the subject matter is always fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I try to I try to jump around from from piece to piece, so that kind of helps. Uh, technique, the experimenting I do is usually when it's something for myself, mm-hmm. um, and it's not you know it's not like something where I'm like you know all of a sudden I'm I'm an abstract artist. It's just stuff that. I want to be conscious of like uh, over the past few years one of the one of the things that I've been trying to improve upon is uh, my treatment of texture on a painting and and surface texture and trying to kind of manipulate that and create my own texture Um, just to kind of you know give the painting a bit of nuance that it you know that my earlier work didn't have Mm -hmm. Um, I do stuff like that but I think more so, I think just switching, you know, from a Mickey Mantle painting to a Bill Foster painting mm-hmm. to a, uh, you know, to a 27 Yankees painting like that, that's, that does enough for yeah. me. Yeah, cool. All right. You have access to a time machine and you can go back and watch one baseball game. Where are you going? <laughs> one baseball game. That's a really hard question. Um, in person, we're, we're saying, mm-hmm. right? Um, Unless you'd want to watch it on TV. But yeah, I would imagine that the in-person experience would be more interesting. This is what I would like to do. It's not necessarily a specific game. And, you know, obviously physics and time notwithstanding. If there was some way that I could see a game with my dad and my grandfather. Actually, probably even my grandfathers, both of them. That would be tremendous. Um, my my grandfathers, both of them, uh, passed away when I was pretty young. Mm-hmm. Uh, on my mom's side, uh, in 1984, 85, so I was only four or five. And uh, on my dad's side, it was uh, 88, I think. So I was eight. Um, but uh, on my dad's side, he was a big New York Giants fan. So you know, the players he grew up watching were. Christy Mathewson, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, Rube Marquardt and, and I guess Casey Stengel for a time and Mel Ott and Carl Hubble. Those were his boys. And um, on my mother's side, uh, her dad was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. So he I think I think he was less of an avid fan than my other grandfather. But he got to see the Dodgers of, you know, the 30s and the 40s and and, you know, those horrible teams, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if he saw like Dazzy Vance or, or, or you know, people going back that far, mm-hmm. but I figure like late 30s, early 40s, he probably would have seen those guys. I think if there was a way that I could go, if there was a way I could see a game with them, that would be, that would be the best. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. 
Yeah, that's where if you were going to watch one in person, what stadium would you prefer that be at? Um, well, if if we're talking about the stadium that I would have wanted most to kind of see and like take in as a fan, mm-hmm. it's probably Ebbets Field. Okay. If it's one that I want to take in because I want to take notes for my paintings, <laughs> then <laughs> it's probably Yankee Stadium for, you know, from like 23 to about 36. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, N- no polo grounds? You l- leaving well, the polo, polo grounds out of it? But the thing is, I, I definitely would want to see the polo grounds mm-hmm. too. I'd want to see them all. That's yeah, the problem. Right. But for <laughs> the, I guess for the sake of, you know, I guess answering your question uh, properly, I guess, then I'd pick those. But yeah, I'd want to see them all. Yeah. And I want to see the polo grounds. Yeah. I want to see Ebbets. I want to see Sportsman's Park and Scheib and all those places. Yeah. Uh, and go back even further. Yeah. You know, back to the 1900s and and those ballparks yeah is there a favorite stadium that you that you have uh to paint i think yankee stadium and the polo grounds i think they're kind of tied because you know the yankee stadium you know it's the it's the place that my dad grew up going to so you know it's like i know that he'll see the painting and it'll bring back memories for him mm-hmm. polo grounds because my grandfather yeah because i'd like to think that if he I'd like to think that if my grandfather is somehow watching down on me or whatever and knows what I'm doing, then, you know, maybe he's pleased. Maybe he's, you know, experiencing memories or whatever. Yeah. uh, In that ether of the afterlife or whatever that is. (laughs) (laughs) I'm curious if there's a particular piece of yours that you're really proud of. Like, imagine somebody had never seen any of your work and you had to show them one piece that was like, this is what I do. What what piece from your career would you be like, this is what I do? That's a great question. Most of the time people just ask, you know, do you have a favorite piece? But like that, I like how you phrase that much better. That's indicative of what I do. There's one painting that I did of Johnny Vandermeer a couple years back. It's for a client who's a, a big Vandermeer fan. And uh, it's just based on a photograph of him uh, in the dugout, you know, looking at the cameraman. And there's something about the the shade in the dugout and the light that's kind of creeping up onto his foot that I think I was able to translate into a, a painting that I think is indicative of what I kind of strive for. Because seeing the shot of it, you know, in black and white, it not saying that it's boring but there's nothing there's nothing terribly amazing about it it's a pretty pedestrian photograph but i think that i was able to kind of do something to make it um i don't know if profound is too much of a reach but i think there's something that i was able to do to it that made it more special Mm -hmm. uh yeah you brought it to life yeah i think i hope um i think that's i think that might be a good one cool i think so Topps has hired you to uh, paint 20 original pieces for their 150 years of baseball set. Yes. What is it like to see something that you created on an actual official baseball card? Uh, that is a crazy, crazy experience for me. How did that come about? They Apparently my, uh, my agent guy... Uh, had been in contact with them years ago and uh and i think they were interested in having me do something and it never really worked out and then i think maybe he reached out to them again or maybe they reached out to him and they were just kind of able to to make something happen and they you know they had this set that they were going to offer up online and they wanted these artist renditions and they i guess they wanted something different or or maybe special, um, and they they hired me to 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 be that guy, and it's been. I mean, you know, it's kind of like full circle. You know, going back to when I was a kid, seeing my father's cards, and it's like, oh, okay, I'm the artist of this baseball card. That's kind of crazy. Does it trip you out to think that there's going to be a kid looking at your card, thinking? That's something I can do. And in 30 years, he's going to be doing a podcast with somebody else about his art career. Shit. (laughs) You know what? 
I never even thought about that. But yes, that, wow. Yeah, you just kind of blew my mind there. Because <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I just think like, you know, maybe artists will look at the, uh, look at my artwork on the cards and will be like, oh, you know, this is, this is trash. And you know, Tops <laughs> made a mistake up. here. <laughs> you know, why, why did they hire this hack? But yeah, the fact that maybe a kid will, wow. Yeah, I can't even articulate what that would mean. Um, I was on FaceTime with my father when the first card uh, came out, or at least when he received the first card. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we were just talking, because I, I FaceTime with my parents all the time. They're in Florida, uh, you know, to have them see the kids and whatnot, or the grandkids. Mm-hmm. And uh, my father was like, oh, you know, look what arrived today. And you know, he's, he just, like, holds up to the camera the card. And... I could kind of see like in his face like what it meant to him and like how cool it was to have his son you know doing artwork for Topps baseball cards something that he collected when he was a kid right and I think there was he didn't he didn't say as much there was like an unspoken thing mm-hmm. I think that was that was something that was really special yeah um, he's got to be so proud I think, I hope, I mean, he is, you know, I, my parents, my parents and I, I think we have a a really great relationship and they have been, you know, my, when it comes to my career and really my life in general, they've been like my, my rock of Gibraltar. I mean, they've been so supportive and encouraging and, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't be where I am now without them. Um, so it, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, it's like everything I, I do, I'm, I'm mindful of how lucky I am to have that. Um, not only, you know, not only as an artist, because I do think that that having like an artist, having a support system like that is incredibly important and crucial to, to making it in, in any kind of artistic endeavor. But, you know, just as a person, as I know that so many people don't necessarily have great relations uh, relationships with their family mm-hmm. or parents and you know I I'm really lucky in that sense and uh, I think at some point you know I'm I'm gonna feel that way about my own kids and whatever it is that they do I mean I pray that they don't become artists <laughs> but you know I, I'm 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 kind of anxious to know what that feels like to be on that end of it yeah if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You're also in the middle of a huge undertaking with the Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and why you felt that that was an important cause for you to give your time to? Yeah, that. so that project has been kind of a, a dream uh, come true, really. Uh, kind of like in the way that the Tops thing is a dream come true. Uh, so the guy who uh, who's behind it all is a, a collector named Jay Caldwell. And he is, uh, he's really into Negro League Baseball, and um, he has been collecting it for a long time now. And he kind of, he saw my work and really, I guess, vibed to it. And he saw some of my, uh, some of my small portraits, and he was like, okay, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll commission you to do a few of these guys. And then, you know, a few turned into many uh and then many turned into shit ton and he kind of got the idea of you know the timing is right where next year 2020 is going to be the centennial of the uh, formation of the negro national league and he wanted to try and celebrate that so he commissioned uh over 200 of these portraits from me and he is going to have those portraits and uh, some artwork from other artists, and his memorabilia displayed at the uh, the Negro League Baseball Museum, and uh, I'm like you know beyond honored to be a part of it, but also just kind of beyond honored to to you know bring some of these guys back to life. Um, it has been a great learning experience in that I think like a lot of collectors you know i know who josh gibson is i know who satchel page is and and you know i know the name cool papa bell but because of jay and because of this project i i mean i'm able to learn about guys that i had no idea existed 
I'm able to learn about these leagues that I had no idea existed. Yeah. And what these players did in these leagues, not only athletically, but just kind of socially what they had to go through. Not not even just the Negro League players, but he, he's also focusing on a lot of players from the... Uh, the Latin the leagues. The Latin leagues. Yeah. So, yeah, like Cuba and Dominican Republic. And thinking that, you know, someone like Josh Gibson, you know, while he can have success in the Negro Leagues, he would go into the Cuban Winter Leagues where he can make more money because he couldn't play, you know, other professional mm -hmm. ball with the white major leaguers here in the States. But, you know, he had to go to Cuba where he could make money and support himself and support his family. And, and it was there that he was actually treated like royalty. Like right. these guys, these guys... Like he deserved to be treated. Exactly, yeah. These guys got the adulation that they deserved. And, you know, being a part of bringing that story to other people and trying to kind of show them uh, or educate them uh, in some small way is so important to me. And, you know, that, that also comes back with, uh, it also comes back to painting, you know, the, the entire tapestry of the game because mm -hmm. the Negro Leagues and the Latin Leagues are a part of the game as much as anything else. Yeah. And, you know, what they went through, what those guys went through, you know, in the 19th century, you know, with Cap Anson and, and you know, forming their own leagues and, and uh, you know, through integration, it's like that stuff transcends just baseball and sports history. I mean, that's that's part of American history. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's 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 shameful uh, that that things were like that. And I think I think it's important to kind of remind people or show them that that's what it was like uh, you know in the hopes that it never happens again yeah I mean, to me one of the most powerful things about the Negro League Baseball Museum is the way that it's laid out where it's it's the timeline and it you know goes in chronological order and so above you know the the center half of the wall is the Negro League Baseball or you know black baseball in America that history and then below the center line is just American history and uh, civil rights history. Okay. And the the stark difference of what were you allowed to do in the country? What were you allowed to do on a baseball field? What were they asking to you to do for the military? But what were they not allowing you to do as it, <laughs> you know, and it's it's when you go there if you can look at those displays and not just be embarrassed for this country um it's it's a powerful museum it's one of the best i've been to yeah i i still haven't been and i really want to and you know i i'm not you know keeping politics out of everything i just i think that there's so many things that are so divisive in this country and hell even in, in this world and i think you know baseball has kind of like the ability to kind of bring people together and I think that's why it's so important. And I think that's also why so many people gravitate towards it. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to kind of be aware of that history and to, you know, for lack of a better word, celebrate it. And, and again, you know, make sure that, that those, you know, atrocities just don't happen yeah. again. Okay, so you've got the Negro League Baseball Museum covered. Uh, but you also have pieces in the Bob Feller Museum and the Yogi Berra Museum. Um, are there any other baseball museums that you might want to have a piece <laughs> displayed at some point? I see where you're going with this. <laughs> uh, I hear the Babe Ruth Museum is pretty nice. I do actually. <laughs> I, I would. I listen. I would love to be in any museum. Um, I think I, I hear there's a Joe Jackson museum. There is. Uh, interesting. I might know a guy. You might know a guy you who knows know, a guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I. You know, I'm like I said before. Like I'm, I'm, I'm honored and grateful that anybody you know likes what I do enough to even commission something or want something to be in any kind of museum. You know, whether it's the Yogi Berra Museum or, or or Cooperstown or or the Joe Jackson Museum. I mean, it's it's just it's all a part of. I don't know. It's just it's. 
if I can get my work in any of those places just to kind of celebrate those people and to celebrate the game in that way, then, you know, that would be, that would be killer. I mean, for lack of a better phrase, it's like, you know, like those are highlights, yeah. like career highlights that, uh, that you don't forget, Yeah. you know, like meeting, even though the, the museum is now kind of defunct or it's in like a state of flux, you know, meeting Bob Feller and, and giving him his painting, um, you know, that was like a highlight of, of my life, yeah. you know, like seeing him light up and he actually, <laughs> he actually, he mentioned something, uh, I, I had done the painting for him it was, uh, was a painting of his, uh, his opening day, no hitter, mm-hmm. uh, in 1940. And he, I guess somebody had already done a painting of that same game for his museum. And he was saying how I got the the look of the stadium and the look of the day it was like so right on because it was such a cold like gloomy. overcast gloomy yeah. day at, at Comiskey and he's like you got that right and then you know the other guy who did the, the painting for me you know made it like this bright and sunny blue sky and, <laughs> and you know he said it in like his gruff voice yeah. and I was like he's like awesome. none of us were happy we were all miserable you were all miserable <laughs> <laughs> it was freezing I hated it <laughs> but yeah that you know that like just meeting him and like thinking that I actually got him to go back to that day in a, in a new way, that was really special. So if I could, if, if my work can be in any space, whether it's a public or private space, and if, if it can do that for someone, then I feel like I've really, you know, accomplished something. Awesome. Uh, at the beginning of this interview, I asked you for five numbers. Oh, and yes. And those are coming into play now because it's time for our quick pitch segment. It's a lightning round, so you oh, can shoot. You don't need to elaborate on these answers. Okay. <laughs> if you don't want to, uh, if you want to, go for it. Okay. Uh, the first number you picked was twenty-three, so we're going to go to question twenty-three. Uh, money is no object, and you have access to every public and private collection in the world. If you could have one baseball artifact, what would you want for your own personal collection? Holy shit. Oh my god, one personal artifact. Okay. Um uh, This is not very lightning because I have to think about it. That's okay. Okay, the first thing that came to mind was the jersey that Lou Gehrig wore when he gave his speech. Cool. That's a good one. I'll take that. Right. I, I accept enough. that answer. Fair enough. You've painted it multiple times. I have. I have. <laughs> yeah. It's for research purposes. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> not to enjoy. <laughs> Uh, okay, then you pick number seven. Where do you like to sit when you go to games? Ooh, good question. Uh, I'm not. I'm not super partial. I. Um, <laughs> I. It's funny because I like the bleachers um, because of the energy mm-hmm. uh, out there, but I also don't like the bleachers because I'm very fair skinned, so I get burned very easily. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, um, so how about like the bleachers on a cold, gloomy opening day, 1940? Maybe uh, something yeah, like that. Well, you know, if I'm properly dressed, <laughs> I, I'll tell you what. I, I, uh, the opening, uh, the opening season for the new Yankee Stadium, 2009, uh, in May of that year, a friend of mine got tickets. Uh, I don't know what, you know, what the level is called. Whether it's like the Legends level mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, I got these seats behind home plate. Uh, five rows back and I'm watching the game first few innings Jabba, uh, Jabba Chamberlain was pitching I'm watching him on the mound and I'm just thinking to myself you know seeing that human beings could be that big yeah. same thing even before the game you know A-Rod is just kind of soft tossing comes up like right to the net and you know he's just kind of flicking the ball into the outfield mm-hmm. and again these guys are huge so actually like seeing the game from that angle was really Eye-opening. really awesome. Yeah. So maybe maybe it would be something like that. Okay. But that also puts me, you know, in the seats with like a lot of you know, maybe the energy is pe- different. Yeah, it's like rich people <laughs> who don't really care about baseball. Right. But maybe they would buy paintings. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Bring business <laughs> cards. Yeah, I gotta know. <laughs> All right, uh, then you pick number nine and that one is if you could play catch with one person in baseball history, who would you wanna have a game of catch with? Can I be corny? Sure. But I love corny. My dad and my grandpa. Okay. Where would that game of catch take place in your fantasy here? For some reason in my weird head, uh, it takes place in my childhood home. 
uh, which I lived for the first 30 years of my life <laughs> in Rockland County, New York. Beautiful cool. suburb of New York City. Uh, number 44 was your next one, and that one is, what number did you prefer to wear if you had your choice growing up, and why did you pick that number? <laughs> oh, that's an easy. The number was uh, nine, actually. Nine was uh, Greg Nettles' number, uh, and being named after Greg Nettles, I always gravitated towards number nine, so that was that was always the, uh, the preferred number. I don't remember ever getting it, but, <laughs> but I, I wanted it. Cool. Uh, and then the last one you picked was 75, and that one is, what is your favorite book? Baseball or otherwise. How about one of each? What's your favorite baseball book? Jane Levy's uh, Mickey Mantle book and her Kofax book, actually, are two of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, I love how she writes. I love how she framed everything in there. Uh, I was really able to kind of connect with both of those guys in a way that I guess I hadn't before. Uh, there was something really special about that. Um, I'll stick with those two for the baseball ones because okay. I, I don't want to go off on too many tangents. Yeah, this is a lightning round. I, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm <laughs> brevity is not my is okay. not my thing. Um, mm, non baseball, okay. Um, well, I mean, I you know like I had mentioned before that I was a you know a fantasy guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I I'm a nerd. I, I did love The Hobbit. I loved Lord of the Rings books. Um, the first uh, book in uh, Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, I enjoyed that. That's one of my favorites. Um, my wife, who is a writer, uh, one of the books that she came out with is actually one of my favorites called The Geek's Guide to Unrequited Love, which is uh, about a, uh, uh, a romance that kind of takes place over the course of uh, three days during uh, New York Comic Con, something that we actually go to a lot. So. Uh-huh. Uh, so that one really like pulls on my heartstrings too. Cool. Um, yeah, great. I'll call those my favorites. Fantastic answers. A terrific Damn lightning it. round. Not uh, very lightningy, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Is there uh, anything else on the horizon that you're excited about in either in work or in life? Ooh. Uh, well, I am. Let's talk about the immediate future. I am really excited to just be here in Chicago for the National um, because it's my favorite, pretty much my favorite weekend of every year. I get to get away from, like, life, like Mm -hmm. real life and and hang out with a bunch of guys who are into, you know, cardboard. And uh, (laughs) And boy, are they into it. They are way into (laughs) it. And, I, I, you know what, I love them all. (laughs) I love how weird they are because I'm one of them. Um... But, uh, yeah, I mean, I nothing, you know, terribly exciting that comes to mind immediately. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm still always just so excited that I get to, you know, wake up every morning and, you know, when my kids let me paint, um, that I'm able to paint and, like, say that that's my job. That's what I do. And, yeah. I, and I love it. Um, so... I'm still excited to do that. And I'm still excited to say, you know, that I'm grateful for it. That's awesome. Um, how can people find you if they want to see more of your work or reach out to you if they want to commission a piece of their own? Uh, well, I have a, uh, a website, uh, which is uh, gregkreinler.com, uh, G-R-A-I-G-K-R-E-I-N-D-L-E-R. Uh, and I'm on most uh, social media platforms, uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, even on like Pinterest and Tumblr. Uh, but I think I'm most active probably on Twitter. Uh, I think that's probably the easiest way to get in touch with me is through Twitter. Cool. Or through email, which you can find via Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you so much for your time and your thoughtful answers and for everything that you do. I mean, your paintings are ridiculous uh the, the first time i showed somebody your mariana rivera painting of him coming out of uh the bullpen for his last time they were just like okay so it's a photograph <laughs> and i was like i uh, know that's a painting <laughs> and they're like what it blew their mind uh-huh. and then i started going down the rabbit hole and showing them more and more of your work and they're like oh this guy's ridiculous Oh, uh, so well, thank you. You are incredible that. at what you do, and thank I you. Uh, wish you nothing but the best moving forward. Thank you, and thank you for having me, and you know, showing an interest.
<laughs> All right, uh, now it's time for a segment called What'd You Think, Mom? where we talk to my mom who just listened to the interview with me and we ask her what she thinks. This is my real, actual mom. Her name is Lori. Uh, I've always just called her mom, though. Uh, can you say something to prove that you are my actual mom? It all started with those beautiful blue eyes. All right, we will edit that out later on. So what'd you think of the Greg Kreinler episode? I really enjoyed it because I love his art. Um, when I think of things I was attracted to as a kid, I love Norman Rockwell. He is so in the style of that. The subject matter that Norman Rockwell did will forever preserve that era of American history for us. That's what this guy is doing with um, the baseball work. I'm sure he does other topics besides baseball, but this is the niche, and it's it's fascinating. I love it. I also loved when you were asking him about what his influences were, who his influences were, mm -hmm. and um, obviously he mentioned Norman Rockwell, but he also said John Singer Sargent and Anders Zorn, and he had me with those two mm -hmm. because I have their artwork hanging in my house, and they are my favorite paintings. Yeah. The thing that I like about John Singer Sargent and Anders Zorn, they are two peas in a pod, those two guys. It's the way they use color, and with Sargent, for me, white, like no other artist does. The color and the light. And when he, you know, when he said that is what intrigues him, that is what his forte is, uh, when he referenced the one painting where Johnny Vandermeer, where the guy is sitting in a dugout mm -hmm. and his, his cleat is just peeking out on the top uh, step of the dugout in the sunlight, that makes the difference between you know, just a flat painting to, it makes it real. Uh, Johnny Vandermeer is the only pitcher in the history of baseball to throw back-to-back no-hitters in games. So that's uh, Johnny Vandermeer's claim to fame. Uh, did that with Cincinnati back in, I think, the 1930s? Yes. 1939, I want to say, off the top of my head. Some of the photographers he liked, Charles Conlin, George Grantham Bain, uh, you have definitely seen their photos. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the names for them, but... Um... Like he referenced the photograph of Ty Cobb sliding into third base, mm -hmm. which is the iconic, without hyperbole, maybe the most famous baseball picture ever, ever taken. Absolutely, um, that's that's a Charles Conlon. Mm -hmm. um, some of the very famous Shoeless Joe pictures that you know um, right. are are Conlins. He right. was like the one of the preeminent photographers of of that day. The gift of what he's doing is you can look at a whole stack of black and white photographs. And yes, they're interesting, you know, from the dead ball era and whatever. But when you put the color in, and like you said, you know, you look at someone's blue eyes or green eyes or whatever it is, and they're looking back at you from that canvas, that changes everything. Now you have, uh, you have a relationship, you have an understanding, you have a humanization of the subject. And one of the things I was thinking about was the director who did Lord of the Rings, you know, somebody right up his alley, mm -hmm. Peter Jackson, a few years ago for the centennial of World War I, um, was hired by England to do a film taking the original black and white footage of the World War I battles and mm -hmm. everything. So they, you know, the, England said, here are our archives, make this into something interesting. And he's looking, how do I even do that? And so what did he do? They went and did extensive research, just like what Greg is doing, where he's you know going to original source documents. He's trying to figure out what would be the colors of the uniforms. He had original uniforms and so, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and how Greg was talking about, he did the research for Bob Feller's opening day game. What was the weather? What was the sky like? And... That's what they did, too. They went to the battle site on that day to get a feel for what color green was the was the grass. Mm -hmm. And they made this amazing film called They Shall Not Grow Old. That is the film version of what this of what Greg does mm -hmm. with his artwork. And it is the game changer. It takes something that you've seen a million times. And it's interesting for geeks like us who are historians. But when it's colorized, it. Now, every one of those soldiers that you would just kind of not have anything with, now they're real men, young boys, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
the story that Greg told about getting in touch with Bobby Thompson. Right. Like those, <laughs> that kind of story is just so, so cool to me. Yeah. Um, he also told a story about Red Barber, um, mm-hmm. the Jackie Robinson story. So mm-hmm. for those of you who don't know who Red Barber was, he called play by play for over four decades uh, with the Cincinnati Reds in the 30s and then went to the Brooklyn Dodgers for about 15 years then was with the New York Yankees for another decade plus. Um, so, I mean, he was, I think, from like 1934 to 1966, uh, a broadcaster in Major League Baseball. In 1978, he uh, joined former colleague Mel Allen to become the first broadcasters to receive the Ford C. Frick Award Mm -hmm. from the Baseball Hall of Fame. So, um, yeah, just an absolute iconic baseball broadcaster. So that's if you you guys don't know who Red Barber is, that's who he is. Do some more reading on him. He's a super interesting guy. Sure. You've heard some of his calls also. Right. And he was just in the um, Ken Burns baseball documentary series. Right. We just saw him uh, on the Jackie Robinson episode. Yeah. The bottom line is Greg is a romanticist. He's a romantic. Mm -hmm. When you're asking, you know, what game, if money's no object, if time and place is no object, it doesn't matter where or when uh, it is that he's with his dad and his two grandfathers. Mm -hmm. And if he wants to, you know, what, with whom would he like to have a game of catch? His dad and his grandfather in his childhood home. Mm -hmm. He's that guy. And the artwork that he creates is actually romantic art as well because it captures the era and emotes, it has the emotion behind it and pulls you right in. So it, it all comes together. It's perfect. Yeah, so um, Greg, obviously as an artist, uh, a painter, he colorizes photos on canvas, uh, but there's also a bunch of guys who digitize um, artwork as well and old black and white photos. And one of the guys that... Uh, we follow is uh, they're, they're a group called Man Cave Pictures. Um, they're on Twitter at Man Cave Photos. Um, but yeah, just some incredible work there. Uh, their their website is mancavepictures.com. Uh, I believe they're based out of Virginia. And um, they've got one brother uh, who lives in America and one who lives overseas right. who do the, do the um, colorization of those photos. And same thing like you were saying before, you take this black and white image that you've seen a million times and you see it in a way you've never seen it before. Right. And to me, it's so hard to colorize photos properly because so, if you don't get the shade right or the tone right, it looks cartoonish. It looks like Ted Turner hitting classic movies. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> but these guys do it right. Um, there's some just incredible pieces that they've done. And, you know, hopefully there, there's somebody that we can have their stuff up, uh, displayed in the museum at some point, but yeah, they are the Greg Kreinler of the digital photo, uh, world. And I think Greg is the, the best at what he does in the art world. Um, just the, the realism and you can tell the level of research that he's done exactly to get it right. Um, he's he's the guy who gets it right. Exactly. So he called himself an anal perfectionist, but that's okay because that genius is what's generating the the work that he puts out, and it is it's truly amazing. The detail is just amazing. When he was talking about his uh, his mentors, mm-hmm. and he used the phrase the calligraphy of his strokes. Mm-hmm. You know, you and I have been to a art museum or two, mm-hmm. and that is just such a great phrase because how many times have we, you know, almost to the point of being kicked out of an <laughs> art museum, um, gone up to really look at a canvas and analyze it, and what you're looking at is the strokes, the especially with the Van Gogh or somebody like that, mm-hmm. where it's so heavy, and it's so easy to transport yourself to the artist's studio, watching him put on that that. Uh, glob of paint right and have it become something and i don't know i haven't seen one of greg's in person so my thought process is it's probably not quite as severe as um Mm -hmm. van gogh because you're not going to get that detail the way van gogh does it right but the calligraphy of an artist stroke is is really that is the signature Mm -hmm. yeah final thoughts on the greg kreinler episode yeah now i want to go check out his art Maybe at the Sheila's Joe Jackson Museum would be even more convenient. You hear that, Greg? (laughs) 
Okay, so that's it. In the introduction of this episode, I mentioned a trivia question you can answer to win something, and here's how you can do that. First, make sure that you're following us on Twitter at Shoeless Podcast. Then, find the pinned tweet at the top of our profile with the link to the Greg Kreinler episode, which asks this week's trivia question. The answer to the trivia question was somewhere in this episode that you just finished listening to. Retweet that tweet along with your answer, and we'll announce the winner in next week's episode. You don't have to be first, you just have to be right, and you've got to be following us. We'll pick one person who answered correctly, and they'll get a copy of the Babe Ruth Tops card featuring Greg's artwork from the Tops 150 years of baseball set. If you have questions about the museum, about the podcast, or about anything else, you can email me at shoelesspodcast at gmail.com, and I'll try to answer them in next week's episode. If you want to send in a video or audio recording, that's cool too. Hopefully you guys like this episode and are starting to get a sense of what this podcast is truly going to be. If you're into it, it would be a huge help to us if you could rate and review the show on whatever platform you choose to listen on. Five-star ratings help our podcast get shown on more people's suggested podcast page, which means more people will hear our show, and obviously that's the goal. It just takes a couple seconds of your time, but it really helps us a lot. And of course, liking us on social media, interacting with our posts, and sharing things with your friends is great too. No matter how you choose to support us, even if it's just by listening, we appreciate you being here. Until next time, I'm Dan Wallach, and this is My Baseball History.